Hello, everyone. This is Mary Keurig with Front Runners Innovate, and I have two smiling faces today that are just uh, eager and ready to talk to you about some really important subjects uh, in Africa and around the world, actually. So uh, please welcome my co-host, uh, Ambassador Richard Sweat from the United States. So hello, Dick. Nice to have you here. I'm going to let Dick uh, share a little bit about him before we get into talking to our special guest here. So Dick, why don't you go ahead? Well, I'm very interested in talking with Olusiji about uh, his work in Nigeria because I was just there uh, this past summer. I was in the uh, capital city of Abuja. I was in one of the states, uh, the Bielsa state, uh, talking with the governor there. And uh, I also spent some time in Lagos. So um, I'm doing work there. And more importantly, I'm interested to understand who he's uh, working with and what he's trying to do because as Mary has proven in many times in many places, she's very good at putting together uh, people who have uh, common goals and synergies um, that uh, the, the sum of their parts um, is actually great. The whole is greater than the sum of their parts, as the saying goes. So I'm looking to see if we have a whole that we can work on. Terrific, terrific. Uh, Ambassador Sweat and his partner, Michael Rowan, and my company, we do work together on some projects having to do with what we call smart villages, a hybrid version thereof, under his uh, company, Climate Prosperity Enterprise Solutions. So we'll put that link in uh, the interview as well. But our primary guest here that Dick is going to help me interview is Olusiji. I'm going to say it very slowly so that everybody hears Olusiji. Uh, Aina, and he's out of Lagos, Nigeria, and uh, currently anyway, because I know he travels a lot, but the conversation is going to be around economic development and trade, U.S. Africa, and he is a board member of the U.S. Africa Trade Council, also a chairperson for the USB Alumni West Africa organization, and what I think is going to be making this conversation really juicy is the fact that he has experience in the electricity sector, Dick. In this background, well, I, I've uh, met with that. REA <laughs> in Nigeria, so we have we have lots to yes. talk about. I'm working. We do, with, uh, we do, with uh, and actively involved in uh, an organization called Impact Amplifier. We will get to all of that, but we want to know him first. So, welcome, Olusiji. <laughs> Thank you for Thank being you so here much. with us. Thank uh, you so, so, much. <laughs> so finally, we get to hear from you. Tell us Absolutely. a little, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your background that brought you into this kind of work. Thank you so much, very for, uh, Mary, for having me. And I want to thank you so kindly, Ambassador Richard. I'm so glad to be on this call. Uh, again, my name is Olushi Gia, you know, just like um, uh, Mary has rightly mentioned. And um, I always tell people that I have a very, very funny uh, upbringing and very funny background and how all of that evolved into who I am today. Uh, most importantly, I have my first degree in statistics. And then I graduated, you know, as a statistician. And that's the very interesting thing. So after that, I moved into the banking sector. So I've worked with uh, about five international banks. They are Nigerian banks, but they've gone international at this point. And then I walked through until I um, went to University of Stellenbosch Business School in South Africa, where I applied for master's in development finance. Now it's master's of philosophy in development finance. So I went to that in 2008, uh, I haven't worked in the banking. So the beauty of that program was that it was a modular program which allows me to continue with my work and also be able to travel down to South Africa during my vacation to be able to push through that master's program. So I graduated in 2011, and then I have an MPhil in development finance. So that's where I started from. So shortly after I completed my MPhil in development finance, uh, I believe I won't be a banker for long. I've worked in the investment banking and the commercial banking and as well as the retail banking where I interface directly with people at the bottom of the pyramid and to see how I can support small businesses even from when I was in the banking sector. I did excellently well and I migrated into the um, into the e-banking, that's what I call it. So I, become the re I became the regional head for e-banking. Um, just to start with, I started with Union Bank. After Union Bank, I moved to the defunct Standard Trust Bank and then moved to UBA. So all of that are merged together today. They are called the United Bank for Africa, you know, PLC. So I worked with them and then I moved to the defunct Intercontinental Bank, which has also, in a way, merged with the Access Bank. Access Bank is in several countries in London, is in China and a couple of that. So, but I left banking after I completed my master's 
And then I decided to delve in a little bit into the emerging market. So I went into the capital market and then uh, signed up with an organization called Maxi Asset Management, where I was appointed as the chief operating officer in 2008. So uh, I started working with them and then working closely, you know, with the players within the capital market, looking at emerging markets and all of that. Uh, at some point, I worked with them for about five, six years, you know, built very strong uh, portfolios and very strong um, balance sheet. And then the power sector issue came on board because in 2012, the Nigerian power sector, which is usually called the NEPA, the National Electric Power Authority, you know, was unbundled totally. In other words, the private sector came into being to begin to play. Uh, it wasn't a total um, uh, privatization. It was more like a partial one. So it was unbundled. And then the private sector was able to buy about 51% you know, of the stake. And then uh, one of the discos you know, that was unbundled, which is Bini Electricity Distribution Company in Edo State, um, the former managing director of um, Union Bank, you know, where we came, decided to bring in ex-bankers you know, that have expertise in development finance and project finance, infrastructure finance, and all of that. And so I came into the, uh, the disco, one of the uh, distribution company, as a deputy director in 2012. So uh, I worked with them for about one and a half years. And then the federal government of Nigeria set up a funding called uh, uh, Nigeria Electricity Supply Industry Stabilization Fund, which is about 213 billion Nigeria Naira. As at then, it was about $1 billion because exchange rate was about 153 to a dollar. So it was over a billion dollars. And then they were looking for expertise or experts who have past sector you know, experience, who have banking sector experience, who have infrastructure finance experience, and then they were searching around the country to see how they can get a combination of all of that. It took them a couple of months before they discovered there is a young man in Benin Disco, which is me. And then they approached me. <laughs> and then I became the pioneer director of operations for the 213 billion past sector stabilization fund. It was quite interesting. But um, yeah, it was quite interesting. I got into that. You know, I was in Abuja. I had all it takes to work. It was so interesting. So we're working basically with the generating, uh, with the gen calls, with the disc calls, with the IPPs, and also with the TCN, which is the distribution, I mean, the uh, transmitting, uh, you know, power station. It was quite an interesting game, but that was not where my passion is because I can't connect to the bottom of the pyramid. You know, I work with the big players. I work with the big boys. I work with the presidency, uh, with NEC, with um, uh, Embed, and all of those big folks, the MDs of the, distribution companies, of the generating companies, of the IPPs and all of that. But there is an inner passion for me that I want to connect the people at the extreme end of the pyramid, the extremely vulnerable people, you know, and how to connect them to the top. So I didn't see that connection. I, my passion was so heavy. And then USID came calling because there was a project in Nigeria, which is called the Feed the Future Nigeria Livelihood Project. It was about 23 million USD project and then they were also looking at people who have very deep background in banking, who understand entrepreneurship, who can do all of those things, very beautiful uh, conditions and requirements. And then if one of my folks reach out to me, but you are working with the federal government of Nigeria now, you know, it's quite juicy. You have very good outing. The development space is not like that. The development space, you have to sacrifice a lot, you have to work and then all of that. So I don't know, it's, it doesn't really matter. So having worked with Nessai SSB Limited for about a year plus, I had to jump to USID funded project offer. And then I became the director of programs for income and livelihood projects. So I, I, I started there. And then across the Northern Nigeria, you know, about 19 Northern states, including the Ravage, Boko Haram area of Burano, um, Adamawa and the likes of them. And then a lot of my guys asked, why will you go into that? You are going to endanger your life. I said, it doesn't really matter. What is important is for me to be able to connect the extremely vulnerable people and be able to connect them across the ladder, you know, and then work around the income disparity that exists in the country and see how I can drive some of this program to connect all of that. So I joined them happily and I jumped, and I jumped on the work and it was quite interesting. It was a five-year project and I was super elated, super excited but I was able to support 1.5 million women directly on that project. Why? Because I was a budget holder. 
The program was written, but it was also flexible. That is one of the things I love about the USID funded project. It was also flexible for us to be able to um, you know, amend and to be able to bring in new ideas that we were able to found very interesting in the course of the project. And so all of that, I got approvals, you know, as a when necessary to support more of the women, you know, create more of inclusive groups, you know, and then looking at the enterprise development framework and ensure that we're able to support, you know, market systems, both at the local level, at the regional level, and then integrate them and connect them with the international markets. So that's where the areas of my trade and investment began to come into being. And then I worked, you know, across all of that and then finished the project. And uh, I decided to do something a little bit more, you know, expansive. And then I joined the Cognitive Advisory Group. Now, the Cognitive Advisory Group, after we finished the project, was successfully implemented. We completed it. They wanted me to jump another project, but then I had to join the Cognitive Advisory Group based in South Africa. So their work is a mixture of both entrepreneurship, um, um, at the same time, the consulting part of it. So I wanted to consult for more of the big firms and all of that. So I added a bit of consulting into my work. And then I became um, an executive director with Cognitive Advisory, you know, working very closely with General Electric. So anywhere General Electric is going to where they get projects, you know, on power, on rail and all of that, we go there to design, you know, the more like the entrepreneurship program and um, how they can connect to the community and be able to create more like an inclusive businesses around that area. So they don't just go do their project and walk away, but how do we ensure that you know, we stimulate the economy, we create more like a working market within the environment of where they're operating. And that was quite interesting. I was able to work with the National Youth Service Corps where um, they support 350,000 young graduates annually. That's a captive audience of 350,000 graduates. We're able to support them. I work very closely you know, with USID because of my background and my network. And then I had to attend the Global Youth Economic Opportunity Summit in Washington, DC, where I became more like a regular presenter. I talk more about youth entrepreneurship, inclusive yeah. growth and all of that, working very closely with Gallup to be able to you know, undertake some kind of evaluation programs and um, employability programs. And so it was quite an interesting journey. And then at some point, uh, I haven't worked with them because I was working in that terrain of um, South Africa, East Africa, and I've also done some work in Zimbabwe, I've done some work in Kenya, I've done some work in Rwanda, and those like. So Impact Amplifier, who happen to be another South African-based organization that have their offices in the UK and also in Washington. Then they came calling that they've been working within the South African region, and then they will be more interested in coming to West Africa. And so they wanted me to head their business in West Africa uh, with you know, the office sitting in Lagos. And so I took up that role. And what did they do? What did they do simply means they uh, accelerate small businesses, you know, <laughs> small businesses in a way that even beyond the incubation period, they can accelerate their growth and create more like investment readiness program that you know, is good enough to attract different you know, vehicles of funding, whether it's Series A, Series B, Series C up to Series D funding that can help catalyze growth, you know, within that system. So that is both basically what they do, and they do that, you know, in a way that they can support those businesses to be well established. And then we got our first um, um, project for Nigeria, which I also facilitated with the GIZ, which is a German uh, company. I've also supported GIZ in Nigeria, you know, on the uh, several programs that I we work together to design it from bottom to top. So back to the USID before I forget, not only did I support 1.5 billion women, the project focused largely on 6,000 vulnerable households, which again, when we look at it, we are saying plus or minus minimum of six people in a household. So we are looking about 360,000 captive you know, audience that we dealt with on that project. Mm -hmm. But there are also indirect beneficiaries of that project in excess of 4 million, because it was so huge that we had to be able to touch base and expand all of that. So that is my work with Impact Amplifier. I'm also a member of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. The Nigeria Economic Summit Group is a think tank, you know, that bridge between the gap between the private sector and then the public sector. So we also work around different policy programs which we push through the legislators, the National Assembly to see how they can become law. So I sit as the deputy chair 
on um, financial market, financial inclusion thematic group, where we also look at, you know, you know, financial inclusion. How do we ensure that we use financial inclusion as a vehicle, you know, to drive economic development, to stimulate economic growth, and also to move people from poverty, and also see what we can do to bridge the gap between income, you know, disparity and all of all of that. We do that, which is one of the reasons that led me to doing my PhD in um, in my PhD in development economics. So all of that, you know, has been playing out. And then several people began to call me, let's work together. I've worked with World Bank, I've worked with UN, I've worked with um, African Development Bank on consultancy level, you know, to do a couple of work and all of that. And so finally, uh, I've done all of that. Um, the United Nations Economic and Social Council, you know, which I've been working also recognized me and then gave me the ambassadorial status as a UN ambassador, you know, to promote education and all of that, which I also enjoy, you know, yeah. uh, over the years and, um, and a lot of that. And then the US African Trade Council, who has been keenly watching me for the past two years. Uh, before I forget, uh, last year, I was appointed as the chairman economic council for Kogi State, one of the sub-national. Uh, the beauty of Kogi State is that Kogi State is a small state, but it is a connect is a, is a connection between the north and the south. It's so rich that is where we have the Ajakuta steel that has been pending for several years and nothing has been done. Kogi State is so rich in terms of commodity when you come to sesame seed, when you come to cashew, they are large, they are like they are the largest producer of cashew and sesame seed in the whole of Nigeria. So they have very unique, you know, stuff that uh, the governor came and then they look at uh, how can we support, you know, the government of the day. And then I was appointed the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council. And in that member, we have all the big falls in this country, the likes of uh, the MD of Development Bank of Nigeria as a member. We have the MD of First Bank as a member. We have several, several big men who have done 20, 30 years as members. So for me, when I was appointed the chairman, I asked the governor, why did you pick me as the, go as the, as the chairman? You have the former ministers who are members of the, of the, of the council. You have the Nigerian ambassador to you know, several nations of the world who are members of the council. So why did you put me as their chairman when you have all the big ones, the big men and the big women who are there? And then I remember the governor said, not only because you have also have a need for yourself, but we have watched you in the last couple of years and we have seen the way your passion you know, for growth, for inclusive growth, inclusive development has been and we believe that you have that drive you know, to take the state to the next level. Not only do I serve as the chairman of the Economic Council for Kogi State, I also interface and interact with the Presidential Economic Council. In fact, just to add to that, the Chief Economic Advisor to the President, Professor uh, Doin Salami, happened to be uh, a very senior colleague. We've worked on a couple of projects together. We have uh, co you know, authored a lot of programs, so I work very closely with the Presidential Economic Advisory Council. And then I think those are the things that the US African Trade Council has been looking at. And then they approached me and then we had a couple of interviews and then I was appointed you know, to the highest decision body, uh, which is the, uh, the board, uh, the advisory board to be a member of, uh, of, of that work. So that, that is the summary, perhaps if I miss anything. Wow. Thing, what a body of work. And you know, I'm, I know Dick's probably thinking the same thing. I'm sorry, I've got to get off. I feel like I got, I, I've got too much work I've got to do to catch up to even like your first day. Of, I know. Of I know. He, I'm impressed. If he's not a politician, he should be. That was a great speech. <laughs> Just, that was awesome. <laughs> Dick, you want to have some comments? Well, I, you know, I have so many questions. First of all, you know, I, I'm very curious. You work in the energy sector. You, you talked a lot about uh, ener energy generation. Um, I met with the REA on, on a couple of occasions. We're talking with them about mini grid um, operations. All of my visits, and I've had many visits to Nigeria, I, I've come to affectionately refer to the three o'clock afternoon blackout as kind of like the, the, the downtime. That's, that's the, national, the national nap time, yeah. if you will, because yeah. yeah. all the power goes down. And, you know, and one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to address that issue because that is, of course, a very important part of any strong economy is to have consistent power and so forth. 
Um, but my question is, um, in this time where oil prices are going sky high through the roof and whatnot, um, do you have any contact and do you sense anything happening with Nigerian oil that could be beneficial to, you know, making not just better oil sales, but, but converting to technologies that, that could be uh, utilized by projects that I'm involved in, like solar and, and other clean energy uh, applications. And I was just curious, um, what, are your, what are your experiences in that regard? And where do you see that uh, industry in Nigeria moving toward because I think uh, the, the big problem has been that Nigeria, like other countries, um, uh, Venezuela and, and places like that, have not figured out how to diversify um, the revenues that come from the oil industry. And that's something that we're trying to um, identify and implement in our villages is that those revenues are diversified through shares that are given to people at the bottom of the economic pyramid and not just at the top. Very hard, very hard, and, and very great question you have asked, Ambassador, because uh, in twenty in twenty between twenty twelve and twenty fifteen, uh, one of the one of the one of the challenges that the country was faced with then was the fact that there was an oil boom between ninety dollars to about one or two dollars, and um, the school of thoughts believed that the Jonathan administration, you know, had opportunity to save a lot of money, you know, that can use to catalyze growth and all of that. And I believe one of the campaign promises of this current administration is to further, you know, explain to people how they can, you know, work around all of that. And they came back to say the oil prices has been quite low. They came back and inherited about $48 and it moved to about 50 to about 60. Even our budget, both last year budget and the current budget, you know, is running on about 60 naira per dollar. But the question now is because of the war in Ukraine and Russia, the oil price has gone to about 120, 130, and all of that. But unfortunately, the country is not saving a dime. And the reason is not far-fetched. Between, in, in, between the, in the formal, in the previous administration, we have four refineries. The four refineries are not working optimally. But at some point, those refineries were working between 22% to 65% uh, capacity utilization. Yeah. Meaning that if we look at the cost of refined products that we are importing to the country, we are only importing maybe between 40 to 60 percent of what we consume. So we have all of those four subsidies and all of that going on. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this government has injected about 1.5 trillion naira into the four refineries, and a drop of fuel has not come out from four of those refineries, meaning that we are importing fuel yeah. 100%. For consumption. So I think the future of that energy is that we must begin to look at how to privatize the entire four refineries. The four refineries must be able to work in a way that we can have all that it takes, both from PMS to AGO to DPK, and all of that must be available. Dan Gote Refinery is working to do all of that, but we cannot rely on him alone because government has spent in excess of about six trillion naira in the last 10 years on the four refineries. So something must be done. But very quickly, which you mentioned about the alternative energy, uh, it will also, uh, let me also mention, sir, that I've been in that space of renewable energy in the last two or three and a half years. Uh, one of the largest player in that renewable energy sector in Nigeria, uh, New Moon Nigeria Limited, that has done quite a lot and is still doing, uh, brought me on their board when they incorporated their company in Canada. And I'm a, I'm, I sit on that board you know, and all we're trying to do is to see how we can create alternative energy. I have two or three proposals at some point where they want to generate about 100, mega, 100 megawatts of solar energy in Nigeria and in Kogi, in Benue, and all of that. And we were not able to, you know, actualize all of dreams due to some political reasons and all of that. So I see what technology can do a lot to support because the system breakdown, the system shutdown is really affecting the country as we speak. We've had total system shutdown about three times in the last two weeks. There is no power anywhere. There's no energy anywhere. Yeah. We had to run on generator. Yep. And sometimes people had to, people who have solar panel had to do that. There are smart, I call they are not I don't call them smart city because they are not big, but there are small estates who live 100 percent on alternative energy in Abuja and in Lagos. They mm -hmm. have never taken power from the national grid. 
they adopted their own solar. I know a couple of filling stations in Lagos that's not using any other, any other thing apart from solar energy to power their pumps, to do all of that. So I see a lot of work you can do, and I see a lot of collaboration in terms of um, how we can work together you know, to ensure that Nigeria begin to live you know, on alternate energy. Because the problem with power is bigger than generation. Yeah. The transmission has a lot of problems because of the kind of infrastructure that we have at the moment. And I don't see any government being able to fix all of that in the next one or two years. So the best best is to look at alternative energy, which is perhaps solar at this point. So whatever it is you think we can do together, I have the contact, I have the people. Anyhow you want us to work together, it's something I'm open to. And I'm more than you, happy. You and I will continue this conversation after this interview. Oh, I have I have okay. another question though that that will will move us on to a different uh, a different area. Um, one of the things that that we believe in building these smart communities is not only that you implement everything all at once, which is very important for a, um, a, the ability to, to do this for all members of that society and, and give ownership to people at the bottom of the economic pyramid, but the components that go into these communities are very strategically chosen. Um, indoor agriculture, um, you know, alternative energy we've talked about already. One of the things that we're looking at, and I'm talking very closely with, uh, with the, the National Investment Promotion Commission in Nigeria, and I don't know if you know people there, we have uh, good friends that are serving uh, in that organization. Um, we're talking about data processing centers in the rural parts, in Bielsa State, in Niger State, you know, not just in Abuja, not just in Lagos. And, and what we're finding is that um, Oh, out of the 4.5 million data processing centers that exist worldwide, 3 million of them are in the United States. Of the 1.5 million that are distributed around the world outside of the US, less than 100 are on the continent of Africa. And now as a, as a statistician, I'd be very curious to hear your comments with regard to, you know, you put a data processing center in a community and all of a sudden their ability to generate um, a various uh, scenarios of how that ec economy is affected either by natural disaster, natural opp opportunity, um, you know, military disaster, um, governmental opportunity, all of those scenarios can be run quickly in a data processing center that right now doesn't exist in enough countries in Africa to give them that capability. I'd be curious as your background and, and statistics, how you would see that kind of investment and location of those kinds of, of facilities in Nigeria would affect your Nigerian economy. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And I will just draw in a very quick example. Uh, before I traveled, I came back, before I traveled to the United States in November, I attended the Finance and Investment uh, uh, Summit organized by the Federal Ministry of Finance. Um, and I presented along, uh, along um, side with CBN governor, the MD of NNPC, the Minister for Finance herself and all of that. And then the governor of four other governors. And so the Accountant General of the Federation, you know, listened to my presentation within six minutes. And then he ran to me. And then when he ran to me, he wrote something in the paper. He said, go home tonight, look at Gezara Trading Company, read a lot about it, and let's have a conversation the following morning. I said, okay, then he dropped his number. And then I went home, read about it and all of that, and I saw it's a beautiful uh, commodity exchange in Kano, in the city of Kano. And I was very interested, so I was curious. And then we agreed. So he asked me to go and go on the spot evaluation to see what can be done because of data analysis, data centers, and blah, blah. I said, okay, no problem. So I went to Kano. Here are my findings. There is a market in Kano that operates informally. And every day, the transaction that happened in that market informally is in excess of about, it's not less than about $1 million, the trading that happened in that informal market. Everything done in that place is informal. And then I, do, I took a tour around the city of Kano. And I saw huge investment of processing companies um, from GIZ, from different, you know, US and UK, EU, uh, um, European, you know, organizations doing some processing, rice and other 
commodity trading. Then I went to the Gezawa, where the man in question has injected, has injected well over $700 million in different sizes, but nothing is happening. It looks like an infrastructure that's just rotting and wasting. And I did an interview with the, man, with the executive management staff, the managing director of the, the EDs. And all I hear from them is bring money, bring money, and I ask him, all of these you've done, how do you convert all of these to money? You have processing zones in that place. You have, from that place, whatever you process, they can take it to the courts without going through any other custom because the custom is there. They got all the licenses and they are not utilizing it. So at some point, I gave him my findings and I told him, well, if we can do X, Y, and Z, things will, 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 will change better. Unfortunately, he's battling with politics and they are having their convention on Saturday. So he's not really ready, but that's not where I'm going. So where I'm going is, what you have said is something I'm also willing to work with at some point, wanted to work with some, uh, some Russian company gave us some proposal and we wanted to have those data processing center in Kogi, in Kwara, uh, in Edo states. They cited about six states where all of those things can happen because we don't even have statistics. We don't have that kind in this country. Even the federal government is not even aware of the level of trading, the level of commodity trading that's going on in this country. Recently, sir, just this morning, the president had to redeploy the senior staff to go to the oil producing zone. Because why? They've been complained that either 5% or 90% of the oil we produce in Nigeria is being, is being taken away. Nobody can account for it. Yeah. So there is no proper data. So they call it oil debt. It's so, so annoying that at this level, <laughs> with this age, Nigeria is losing 85 to 90 percent of the oil production every day. We, we have a conversation to have on this point, but uh, this is <laughs> you got him this, all excited. <laughs> this is good. this is uh, this is my experience. You are absolutely right. I I think you're being generous to maintain the levels at at you know five to seven percent. I I could I could uh, contest you on that, but but we'll talk. I I would be curious. Um, how how did you meet each other? Um, how did Mary discover you? Uh, you know, I know how I, I magic. Dick. Yeah, yeah. I want I want to know I want to know this magic. I mean, how how did how did uh, the two of you bump into each other and and uh, and come? I, I think I found him. I think I found him on LinkedIn, and um, I was curious about his background. And uh, I kind of trust my gut when somebody lights me up when I feel like there's. There's a story there. There's certainly a conversation and a story with this gentleman mm -hmm. um, and an opportunity to help um, in this conversation. And my marketing mind looks for gaps. That is where something's not being met. And, you know, in that way, I look at this interview as being something I can move forward into somebody who might have a filler for that, that gap, mm -hmm. who might have a resource, expertise, advice, or just a helping hand <laughs> and to help fill that gap. Um, Olusiji has a lot of solutions um, and a great big brain for figuring out the e economics. The, you've got the perfect storm right up here with mm. the st st statistician, the, the, you know, the heart for doing something for the bottom rung of the, the, the people that, that need to be served, that entrepreneurship piece, the impact investing piece, the work with USA. You've got it all, all the relationships that need to come together. And that's what makes Dick such a beautiful, um, you know, co-host in this, because I well, know well, he's putting, he's, he's connecting dots. Well, in this. one of the things that, that I haven't shared with you is that my, my original profession is an architect. So I, I love to build things. I love to create community where it didn't exist before. And my partner, uh, Michael Rowan, as I mentioned to you um, before we started the, the uh, online, uh, the recorded interview, um, he uh, helped author the Native Tribal Corporations in Alaska. And if you go to our website, you'll see uh, the work that he did starting back in the 1970s, which has created this great opportunity for these people um, in, the, in the rural parts of Alaska, uh, living off of seals and fish and whales and you know things like that. Not what you'll find in Africa, but similar economic conditions, you will. Yeah. And um, so that 
sort of led me down this path to, you know, what is the best way for creating economic, sustainable economic activity in a sustainable environmental community that uh, can ultimately serve as a uh, example for how after 50 years and $3 trillion worth of investment in the African continent, why isn't the continent flourishing? Mm. And I think there's a tremendous, uh, uh, a tremendously appropriate answer to that question that hasn't yet been made. And I think that we are on the, on the uh, cusp of doing that and, and having someone like you with the statistical and financial and network uh, abilities that you demonstrate, I think you're a, you're an important player who could have an important role in bringing about this transformation. And I say all that to say that one of the things that we do in creating these communities is that we conduct surveys of the population that will live in and around these communities. Why do we do that? Well. You know, surveys give incredible information about the abilities and the, the hopes and desires and, you know, the things that are important to those people. It also helps us to understand who are the best people to live in these communities that are going to make these communities thrive. And then ultimately, they give a lot of information to the person taking the survey so that they begin to understand how is this different? than what has been happening for these 50 years before where trillions of dollars have been spent and only sent to Swiss bank accounts of the dictators of the countries uh, at the time that those those monies were being distributed. And so it's I think it's a, it's a time for change. It's a sea change um, that we're going to see, particularly in Africa, that gives Africa the opportunity to be the um, the continent of the 21st century. Um, and that's something that that Africa hasn't realized yet, but there are still, you know, uh, 78 years to go. And I think a lot can be done uh, in that remaining time. Perfect. Thank you, Dick. I have one uh, before we get kind of to, towards the end and winding up. I have one question for you re relative to your board position with the Africa, the U.S. Africa Trade Council, and that would be what would make trade better? What would happen? I know that's a huge question, Ash, because I think there's a lot of you know, moving parts to that. But in your mind, is there one priority that you think that would make things easier, better, happen, uh, happen well for, for everybody? Yeah, so, so for me, a uh, very good question because um, I have looked at just like what Ambassador Richard said, why is Africa still where it is today? Yeah. The continent is blessed with, you know, abundance of resources, both natural yeah. and human. Like I mentioned to you, if you take, for example, cashew, if you look at sesame seed, these things are so huge. And I'll give you another example. In 2016, when I was implementing the Feed the Future Nigeria Livelihood Project, um, one of the guys in CRS, uh, in um, uh, CRS is one of those international NGOs mm -hmm. with their head office in Baltimore. And then they came to say they want to do a little bit on impact university. That was where I started delving, I mean, delving into that. And it was on uh, sheer knot, which is sheer butter. And so there is a man, I've forgotten his name now, I can check my card, who is directly saddled with that responsibility in USID at the embassy office. And so they came to say, this particular product is so rich in Nigeria. And then I went into a bit of findings and I discovered that about 11 states in Nigeria are blessed with sesame seed. Six out of the 11 states have the best um, um, sheer knot in Africa. And then Borono State is one of them. Kwara State is one of them. KB State is one of them. So what is the problem? So I went into this, into this state, went into these communities and discovered that this particular seed grows and drops at the back of people's houses. <laughs> and they never need those money. So I interviewed them. Why, you know, they said, no, we eat when we cannot eat, we dump it. So I said, I will help you to make money out of it. Don't grow it. Pick it up. Don't process it. 
just keep picking it up, gathering it. For everyone you gather, tell me how much you want to collect. And I remember that for a kg of that back then, some of them said, ah, if we can give them 25,000 Naira, they will pay. So I had the processing plan that came. How much do you buy one kg? He said, you buy one kg for 225,000. I said, you will pay these women the same amount of what you buy. When I told the women, they ran away and ran inside. I said, that is not possible. Said, we pay you the same amount. Then they called the Angua, they called the chief. We addressed them. And then the big, and then the men came and paid them millions of naira. Women who have never had the opportunity to send their children to school mm-hmm. began to send their children to school. Yeah. They began to build houses. They delve into businesses and all of that. Why? They have this natural resource for years, hundreds of years, living with it without yeah. converting. My first priority is to see all of those decayed resources across the continent of Africa, how it can be converted into money. And that is one of the areas because we need to give financial power to the people at the bottom of the pyramid. Yep. Things will change. Very Once they know they are right, they'll be able to send their children to school. They will also be educated. The simple and then thinking <laughs> about government, government and politics will totally change because no politician will come and deceive them with a piece of 1,000 and then destroy their future for four years. That is my one priority. Rotting resources. God bless you. Africa I think he's common. running for office. <laughs> I don't, I don't I think, think we want him to run, to run for, office. for office. We like him just the I way. I know. He needs to be where he is right now. Oh, um, <laughs> all right. Well, Lucy, the, the last question. And before we get to the last question, you know, you mentioned that there's a book coming in October. You didn't mm-hmm. have the title quite yet. Hopefully sometime soon when you do have the title, we can, you know, add it to the interview uh, in the, the text part. But uh, honestly, you are a book. You're a walking book. <laughs> you really are. Um, so be on the lookout for it because honestly, there's so much, uh, you're a Renaissance guy too. There's so many little uh, pieces to you that move out into good spaces that it's hard to line you up and say, you know, like if, if when, whenever you pass away, they're going to have to have like a, a big monument with all the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> is, is the book about a particular subject or is it about all of the things that you've shared with us? Okay, so so why the book? Um, I led the delegation of Kogi State to the state of Delaware yeah. in November. And I traveled from Wilmington in Delaware to Asheville in North Carolina. Yay. <laughs> so I traveled about nine hours stretch, you know, went through all of that, you know, uh, and something came to my mind. I have had opportunity to talk to young people all over the world. I've had opportunity to speak to them in the US, to speak to them in France, to speak to them across all African countries. And so the question they keep putting across to me is, how did I get to where I am? I have no definite answer beyond the fact that I am committed, I am focused, dedicated to what I do. But People are not convinced to say, how can you be in the power sector, in the financial sector, in the development sector? How did you cut all of this? How did you define your career? Mm-hmm. So I decided to put a book together to reflect on some of these things that happened, how all of this journey came on board. And then, you know, so that's why I've not been able to, to, to fix a title. There have been a couple of titles that came, um, you know, uh, with my producer at some point, but I think I will agree on one shortly but that's exactly so the book is more about uh, not about me but it's more about the younger people and how they can find their part to excel yes yeah. no yeah. i i totally hear what you're saying that's that's a that's a yeah. beautiful idea and it is uh, and and young people are without that kind of of example they uh-huh. don't know which road or which path to follow and uh, i think you know you're going to provide them with some very good choices that will uh, help them become uh, productive citizens in this yeah. world. That's that's yeah. important to do. I do a lot of speaking with youth as well. And a lot of times I look out and I see the, this all going on and I'm like, you know, so, some nugget of, of something that I've shared is going to land on those ears and eventually it may not happen in the next six months, but maybe a year or two from now, they'll go, ah, <laughs> this is what I need to do. Um, I have one final question I told you I was going to ask you before we end up, and that would be, who do you need to meet to help you move forward in the impact work that you're doing? 
without wasting time, I've met two great people today that can define the future. That's where to start from. Okay. Meeting uh, Mary and Ambassador Richard is a good way. I must thank you most kindly. Uh, yes, perhaps I've had one or two interviews before, but this is more, more deep, more elaborate. I was able to um, open up my heart to speak about the things that I know. So I believe meeting people like you, like Ambassador Richard, honestly speaking, uh, I believe a lot is going to be unveiled about the things we can do to better Africa and to better the world. Thank you. Movers and shakers. Thank you. That's what he needs. <laughs> so this has been amazing. You are an incredible human being and uh, Africa, the whole continent's blessed to have you. So, you know, thank you for all the good works that you do. And when you get that book going, uh, give us a, a holler and we'll, we'll get you back on. We'll talk about that. Okay. So you two stay on. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody else and say, if you're watching this on YouTube, go to www.frontrunnersinnovate.com where you'll see this interview and lots of information we're going to get from him this that are links and contact information that kind of thing so that you'll have that uh because i know that you're dying to meet him and he's worth meeting so thank you thank you dick for being with me today as thank well. you thank you so thank you everybody bye-bye until next time happy front okay. running okay uh, and Olu 